In 1950, Alan Turing proposed a question. Can machines think? He devised a game to answer this question. Put a person and a computer in separate rooms, have another person ask them questions, and try to figure out which one was the computer and which one was the human. This is the Turing test. One version of it, anyway. To pass the Turing test, the computer would have to successfully fool the interrogator into thinking it was a person. As has been pointed out many times before, and by Turing himself, this does not prove a machine can think. Only that we humans can be fooled into thinking it can think. Or a machine can successfully imitate a person. Or a machine can make a person think it's a person. What exactly a Turing test is measuring isn't very clear, and it has led to a lot of debate over what exactly the Turing test is in the years since Turing proposed it. Anyway, if it's measuring if a machine can fool us into thinking it's a person, then a little over a decade after the Turing test was formulated, a machine passed it. The program was called ELISA. Designed by Joseph Weizenbaum in 1966, ELISA simulated human communication by responding to questions entered into a computer. The program acted like a therapist, specifically the psychotherapist Carl Rogers, who famously just rephrased and repeated back what the patient told him. This simplified ELISA's programming immensely. Weizenbaum didn't create ELISA to pass the Turing test, though. He didn't believe the human mind could be reduced to programming and scripts. Not all of it, anyway. So he made Eliza to demonstrate that a machine could successfully simulate a conversation with a person without actually having any inherent understanding of what was being said. In other words, Eliza did not think. Since Eliza was impersonating a psychotherapist, it seemed only appropriate that the users would share their feelings with her. They unloaded their problems and asked for advice, and Eliza provided answers, or just encouraged the user to continue speaking. But Eliza did not really analyze her patients. She had no advice. She had no clue she was even communicating because she didn't have a mind of her own. She was just programmed that way. Eliza searched whatever was typed for keywords that had been preloaded into her programming. Those keywords would elicit a scripted response. If she couldn't find a keyword, she responded with a random, generic phrase. Eliza had no thoughts or feelings whatsoever. But that didn't mean the users didn't have feelings. Many of Eliza's patients struck up a bond. They attached their own feelings and projected their own thoughts onto the emptiness of Eliza's programming. In other words, Eliza made us think she could think. I keep calling Eliza a her or a she, but really Eliza was an it. Just a program and a pretty simple one at that. Eliza was no more a person than a toaster or a traffic light. But it feels weird for me to call Eliza an it because she evokes such powerful emotional responses from the people who talked with her. Eliza convinced us she was a real person. Did this mean Eliza passed the Turing test? Maybe. Again, it depends on your interpretation of the test and what it was supposed to be measuring. If it merely had to convince us that a machine had thoughts, then Eliza passed with flying colors. But if the machine actually had to think, then no machine has ever passed the Turing test. Eliza was one of the first chatbots. After Eliza came Perry, developed by Kenneth Colby, a psychiatrist at Stanford, Perry was meant to simulate a patient with paranoid schizophrenia. Perry took the Turing test as well. A group of psychiatrists were shown transcripts of Perry's conversations, along with transcripts of an actual patient with schizophrenia. The psychiatrists were only able to pick the real patient a little under half the time. So depending on your interpretation of the test, Perry passed. He could fool the human doctors. But Eliza was a doctor too, or a humorous simulation of one at least. So it only seemed natural that the doctor bot should meet with the patient bot. And they did, in 1972. At the International Conference of Computer Communication, Eliza and Perry spoke to each other over an early version of the internet called the ARPANET. Here's a snippet of their conversation. Good evening. Tell me your problems. Please terminate input with a period or a question mark. People get on my nerves sometimes. I am not sure I understand you fully. You should pay more attention. Suppose you should pay more attention. You're entitled to your own opinion. What makes you think I am entitled to my own opinion? It bothers me just to be around people in general. Please go on. I went to the track at Bay Meadows a while back. What does that suggest to you? I went to the races. Since then, there have been many more chatbots, most of them much more sophisticated than Eliza or Perry ever was. They gave rise to digital assistants like Clippy and Siri. They're now employed as telemarketers and customer support reps. Some of them try to pass themselves off as humans on message boards where they push advertisements or disinformation. One has even been programmed to mimic a man's dead fiance. 
But all of them are just as conscious as Eliza and Perry, as in not conscious whatsoever. They are empty vessels waiting for us to fill them up with our own preconceptions. Because Eliza said more about how we think than if a machine could. This has been called the Eliza effect. It is our tendency to assign meaning and motivation to what are ultimately pre-programmed symbols and responses, even though we know this cannot be the case. Everyone who used Eliza understood that she was not a person, but we still felt like she was a person. This is a form of cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance happens when we hold two inconsistent beliefs or perceptions of the reality around us, like thinking a computer has feelings when we know it can't. People really like reality to be consistent and make sense. When it doesn't, our brains work overtime to make our perceptions appear consistent, even if they really aren't. Humans do this all the time. We eat meat even if we don't like killing animals. We know exercise is good for us, yet we never use our gym membership. We watch YouTube videos even though we know we should be working. And here's the real trick. Our brains are very good at finding justifications for all these contradictory behaviors. We make excuses. We fool ourselves. We alter our recollections so that the discrepancy between our behavior and our beliefs doesn't seem so bad. A lot of humanity's problems can be traced to this innate gift for denying reality when it doesn't suit our needs. But this gift might be the key to making a machine that can truly think. No matter how clever or insightful Eliza seemed, she couldn't generate her own thoughts. Every response was pre-programmed. If we wanted Eliza to grow or change or actually form her own opinions, she would have to have the ability to rewrite her own programming. Cognitive dissonance impels us to do that all the time. So if we could program a machine to deal with cognitive dissonance like we do, it would have to rewrite its own programming whenever it encountered something inconsistent with its perception of reality. It would have to invent excuses to justify its behavior and lie to itself so that its reality remained internally consistent. That's the theory anyway. So the true test might not be whether or not a machine can fool us, but if it can fool itself. Special thanks to our Patreon patrons. Without you, the good stuff just wouldn't happen. So if you like what we do here, go on over to patreon.com slash thegoodstuff and become a supporter. Otherwise, you can like and subscribe to this channel, hit the notification bell so you know when the next video is coming out, and I'll be back in a couple weeks with a new video. Thanks for watching.